It was the dot-com decade, when big and clunky paved the way for small and smart. Virtual pets sought electric sustenance. People didn't really know how much power was inside this thing. <laughs> a military mover invaded suburbia. George Foreman plugged a little item to knock out the fat. Boom, I was a happy man. And a guy named Tim wove a web of information that changed the world. Now, 90s Tech on Modern Marvels. The founder and CEO of the company that owns this warehouse, and another 26 like it, was working out of his garage in 1995. Today, he's one of the richest men in the world. The wake-up call was finding out that World Wide Web usage was growing 2,300% a year. That was in 1994. And that really started me thinking, what kind of business could you build on the web? Realizing cyberspace would be a great platform for commerce, Jeff Bezos researched top-selling mail-order products and decided to create an online bookstore. Amazon.com opened its site to the world with this web page on July 16, 1995. Offering more than one million titles, the virtual shop sold books in all 50 states and 45 other countries within the first month. We had programmed a bell to ring every time there was an order. And it only took a few days before the bell became annoying. <laughs> so it did grow fairly quickly. First year sales surpassed $15 million. By the end of the 90s, Time Magazine named Bezos Person of the Year. In early 1999, Jeff Bezos set a mission to grow his company from a books company to an internet retailer that could sell anything in the world. I'm standing here in Fernley, Nevada, an 800,000 square foot facility that ships hundreds of thousands of units a day that was part of that vision. The facility was completed in January 1999. With a few exceptions, the system put in place then is the system Amazon uses today. Thousands of workers and more than six miles of conveyor belts keep the cyber goods rolling off the shelves. In the beginning, pickers walked around with a little list of paper with the items that they needed for each of the customers. Today, we use wireless RF scanner guns. While we do use library shelving, it's not Dewey Decimal System. Basically, a person stowing the books can stow that book anywhere they like. Then the picker is simply directed to that location. Once picked, items head to sorting and packaging. This part of our facility is where all the orders come together. Each one of these chutes is a customer order. So all the items are coming from all over this facility, sorted into the particular chute. The key to this automated system is the tilt trays. Each item slips onto a tilt tray that carries it to the order's assigned chute. Since the tilt trays move at a uniform speed, the system calculates the exact travel time to the designated chute. At just the right moment, the tray releases the product. When an order is complete, a light alerts the workers to box it up. So I have to admit, when we opened this building in 1999, we didn't exactly know how to run all this equipment very effectively. But today, Amazon has the process down to a precise science. And shipping from 27 individual warehouses, it's come a long way from its mid-90s garage roots. Raising the initial startup money for Amazon.com was very difficult. The first question I had to answer for almost all of these investors, maybe all of them, is what's the internet? <laughs> uh, and which was very normal at that time. Most people didn't really know what was going on with the internet or what the World Wide Web was. While many people use the terms internet and World Wide Web interchangeably, the two are not synonymous. The internet connects small computer networks to larger networks and finally to a global system of computer networks around the world. The World Wide Web, better known as the Web, is a system of interlinked computer documents that are accessed via the Internet. While the Web is a large portion of the Internet, the Internet is also used for email, instant messaging, and file transfer. The development of the Internet began in 1969, when the U.S. government's Advanced Research Projects Agency 
connected four of its research computers together through a 56K line. 21 years later, in the fall of 1990, there were 313,000 computers connected on the Internet. But the U.S. government restricted the use of this primitive Internet to research purposes only. And unlike the graphics-laden environment we take for granted today, the screen interface was a blank slate that required expert knowledge of text command. The World Wide Web changed all that. While working at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, British scientist Tim Berners-Lee saw the need for a user-friendly system for sharing information across the Internet. By combining hypertext, computer documents that link together, with the Internet, Berners-Lee created the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, and coined the term World Wide Web. And in the winter of 1990, he built the three tools necessary for a working web. The first web server, or internet computer, a web browser or software application used to surf the web, and web pages, which describe the project. On August 6, 1991, Berners-Lee decided to give the World Wide Web free to the public so that it would continue to grow, revolutionizing the way we use computers and communicate. So how is it that you can access billions of web pages online with just the click of a mouse? When you enter a URL or address on your web browser, it points to a specific web page on a web server. Routers direct the request from your computer across the network to the web server and then send the information back to display the web page. And some advanced routers today can run at a capacity of up to 92 terabits per second. That's two billion times faster than the original 56K line of 1969. Although seven out of every 10 Americans use the internet, North America ranks third behind Asia and Europe in web traffic. By June 2007, more than one billion people, or about 17% of the world population, had used the internet. Imagine when that number grows to 50% or 80% or 90% of the global population sharing their lives, sharing experience, sharing knowledge, sharing information. It fundamentally changes how we are as a society. While the web browser was the gateway to a world of information, you still needed to know the web address to access it. So what if you didn't know the address? Enter Google. Google is a so-called crawler-based search engine that can direct you to pertinent websites by crawling the web and sorting through its increasingly massive amounts of information. Information on the internet is growing at such an amazing rate that in about three years, it's anticipated that it will double every 11 hours. So what happens when you use Google to search 90s pop star Britney Spears? The Google search engine uses spiders that crawl the web scanning each web page on a regular basis. This data is entered into an index, much like the index of a book. When you enter a search query, Google software sifts through the index and ranks the matches, returning results in order of relevance. And in this case, you get more than 49 million results in just 0.04 seconds. That's because Google has countless computers clustered around the world working in tandem to scour their index. But this popular site wasn't always so expansive. As you can see, it says the index contains about 25 million pages, and that was big for that time. And now we have billions and billions of pages. Founded by two Stanford University students, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, Google launched in September 1998. Google. G-O-O-G-O-L is a very large number. It is the digit one followed by hundred zeros. And Google is a play on the word Google to depict our mission of capturing and organizing large and vast amounts of information. Though Google won't release the amount of servers it has today, some industry experts estimate there may be as many as 450,000. But back in 1998, 
Google had just 30 server racks like this one. Each rack held 80 computers running on Intel Pentium 2 chips. Since their data center charged by the square foot, they crammed the computers in four to a shelf. By the end of 1998, Google was answering 10,000 search queries each day. Just two years later, that number had grown to 100 million. But the 90s brought many more internet innovations. In 1996, email became the main source of communication in the United States, eclipsing both the telephone and standard mail. The 90s also ushered in AOL, instant messenger, chat rooms. The options were endless. And the notion of web surfing literally came up where people would surf for hours from site to site to site. And the portable computers of the 90s let us surf the web from anywhere. But this innovation traces its roots to the 80s. As preposterous as this looks to us today, this is the beginning of the portable computer, and this is the Osborne One. This is a CRT screen. It's five inches diagonal. It can display about 50 by 24 characters, no graphics whatsoever. You would fold the keyboard up into the case like this, snap it down, and it became <laughs> a 25 pound boat anchor kind of thing, but you could take your computer with you for the first time. But by the beginning of the 90s, this is 1991 technology, the PowerBook 170, which had everything you'd want in a modern notebook computer. It has a nice screen, has the trackball, and notice how the keyboard is actually moved back to give you these palm rests here. It's really the defining embodiment of everything notebook that follows it in the 1990s. The 90s even miniaturized the cell phone. We're shrinking. The processor, the memory, the display, the battery especially, adding new features like this flip phone feature to channel the Star Trek communicator. Finally, by the end of the 1990s, you have phones that are so small and so inexpensive that they're everywhere. Just about everybody owns one. The 90s also saw the marriage of the cell phone with the laptop computer, creating the smartphone. This is the Simon from IBM and Bell South, it is the world's first smartphone. It is really the precursor to what we think of today as the Blackberry. It had a calendar and all the other little things that we think of as standard features. But at the time, the idea of carrying this much power in your hand really was revolutionary. While the creation of the World Wide Web transformed the computer into a new entertainment and information medium in the 90s, the use of computers in virtual pet toys created a national security threat. In 2007, over 170 billion email messages were sent per day. That's almost two million emails every second. 70% of them were spam and viruses. 90s Tech will return on Modern Marvels. RoboCup 2007. With no remote controls or human intervention, eight Ibo robotic dogs compete in four on four soccer competition. Thanks to the technology of the 90s. So, this is the first Ibo introduced in 1999. Um, this is the 110 and 111 series. Ibo is actually an acronym for Artificial Intelligent Bot, but Ibo in Japanese also means PAL. In 1999, when they came out, they were $2,500. In June 1999, the first batch of 3,000 Ibos sold out in just 20 minutes. And by the end of the year, Sony had produced and sold an additional 60,000. Ibos are called autonomous robots because they're able to learn and mature based on external stimuli from their owner and surroundings. So if you wanted it to play with the pink ball a lot and you kept telling it was a good dog when it played with the pink ball, it would learn that that's a good thing. As Ibos mature, they save all of their new memories, just like a computer. And all that junk is stored in his trunk. All of the brains of the Ibos um, 
look essentially the same. They're just memory sticks, just like you have in a modern digital camera. And actually, the original IBOs only had up to an eight megabyte of storage. The RoboDog's joints allowed for 20 different movements. Housed in his head was a sensor to react to touch, a microphone for hearing, a video camera for vision, and a distance detector. The IBO was the culmination of the virtual pet boom of the 90s. What got it started was the Tamagotchi. A Tamagotchi is a virtual pet housed in an egg-shaped casing. It means egg, and in Japanese, it's a cute, lovable egg. Tamagotchi exploded into popularity in the United States in 1997. It was just amazing. People were lined up in the streets to see this. In its peak year, Tamagotchi sold over 40 million units worldwide. And I think what's so amazing is that if you translate that, that's 15 units every minute. Three buttons allowed the owner of the pet to feed it, play games with it, check its hunger and happiness levels, and even perform a pet owner's least favorite task, cleaning up after it. And if not taken care of properly, your Tamagotchi would actually kick the bucket, just like a real pet. Two button-sized 1.5 volt batteries kept the virtual creature running, and all the commands ran through a computer chip. And it had nearly double the power of the Osborne One portable computer of 1981. We created the virtual pet. It was something that was never done before. But just one year later, the little digital critters had a tangible, furry competitor. No discussion of the 1990s would be complete without talking about Furby. Introduced in 1998, it was the world's first autonomous robotic pet. So as a robot, it's able to move things like its ears and its mouth and its eyes. It also speaks, and it speaks a language called Furbish. The more you played with your furry Furby friend, it would speak less Furbish and seem to learn English. What it really did was gradually reveal up to 100 pre-programmed English words. Because of this, there was a common misconception that Furbies repeated the words set around them. And some government officials thought the toy could threaten national security. In fact, the National Security Agency in Maryland banned its employees from bringing the little guy into its buildings on January 13, 1999. People didn't really know what was going on here. They didn't know how much power was inside this thing, so it scared some people. Despite its treasonous reputation, Furby sold more than 15 million units by the end of the 90s. The Furby cost about $35 in 1998, which is pretty expensive for a toy. But when you take apart a Furby and look inside, you realize why it costs so much. It really was a miracle of, of modern technology. The Furby came fully equipped with touch sensors on the front and back a microphone to pick up sound, a sensor to detect light, an infrared port to communicate with other Furbies, and even a sensor that could detect upside-down movement. One of the things that let them keep the cost down was a design feature that used just one electric motor that drove a cam system. So this single motor with the cams can drive the ears, the eyelids, the mouth, and the ability of the Furby to tip up and kind of move forward. The microprocessor has about four times the power of the Apollo moon lander. It's, it's an amazing amount of processing power to fit into such a small and inexpensive package. Furbies, Tamagotchis, and Ibos may have had a leg up in the world of toys. But in the mid-90s, it was the George Foreman lean, mean, fat-reducing grilling machine that really delivered a knockout punch.
I had fallen in love originally with the grill because I could get up early in the morning and have actually salmon and bagels. And I could actually put the bagel on the grill, turn one this way and the other the opposite. I would grill on both sides and then have the salmon ready, put a little cream cheese, boom, I was a happy man. While similar hamburger grills were available at the time, the George Foreman grill introduced and patented a sloped design that allowed the fat to drip away from the meat. That was just what two-time world heavyweight boxing champion George Foreman was looking for. Everybody was calling me the man Mr. Cheeseburger, and I'd made a joke because everybody laughed about my weight that uh, I could go and eat a dozen cheeseburgers and then become heavyweight champ of the world. So now, how could I get high-protein food and with little fat? the George Foreman Grill. In 1995, we introduced our GR10, which was a two hamburger size. It retailed at $39.99. By the end of the 90s, more than 14 million grills had flown off the shelves. Though the size had grown to hold up to eight burgers, the technology remained the same. This is the original construction that was used for these uh, grills. We have a heating element that's pressed into the die cast, and uh, the thermostat here maintains the temperature on the cooking surface at approximately 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a great temperature for cooking hamburgers. A floating hinge ensures the meat, no matter how thick, stays in close contact with both sides of the grill. For Salton, this simple yet revolutionary grill was almost the one that got away. No one was interested in the grill. But a gentleman that came to me and uh, he said, I think I have a customer for it. And I said, you know, I can't sell it. So if you want it, it's yours. The potential buyer was none other than George Foreman. I sat there and looked at it for days and months. So finally my wife ate some food on it, the grease went away. I was afraid of that because too much, you lose so many juices, it's not gonna be juice anymore to me. But it come to find out it was just great. Oh, that looks good. George didn't want to be marketing it himself. And as it turned out, it, uh, the advice came to him that Sultan would be the best company to do it. And so it came right back to me. And after that, it was like a Japanese bullet train. Sultan had sold more than 90 million George Foreman grills in just 12 years, over $5 billion worth. The George Foreman grill may have revolutionized the act of grilling, but some other sizzling technologies of the 90s forever changed the way we see and when we see TV. Not all toys had to be robotic to be popular in the 90s. The low-tech Beanie Babies, introduced in 1993, sold more than 100 million units in just three years. 90s Tech will return on Modern Marvels. Step into any electronic store and you'll be surrounded by indispensable digital gadgetry spawned in the 90s. The digital revolution of the 1990s not only brought us information overload, but also gave us countless ways to extend our inner couch potato. Case in point, the DVD, introduced in December 1995. At first glance, DVDs seem very similar to CDs. They're the same diameter and thickness, and their digital data is encoded in a long spiral of microscopic pits and bumps. But at 4.7 gigabytes of capacity, a DVD can hold almost seven times more data than a CD. That's because the pits and bumps are four times smaller on a DVD, making the spiral tighter and longer. And unlike a CD, a DVD can have up to four layers of data, increasing its capacity to almost 26 times more than a CD. And though DVDs are three times smaller than the analog laser discs pioneered in the 80s, they can hold more than double the data. The payoff for consumers? For the first time, it was possible to fit an entire movie, and then some, onto a digital disc. But that was only because of another 90s advancement, digital compression. A movie would need about 40 times more space. The disc would be, you know, three feet in diameter or something if it held a movie in its native format. So what they do is compress the movie by a factor of about 40 to 1 using something called MPEG-2 compression. MPEG-2 compression reduces the size of a video file 
by reusing any identical video information. Rather than storing all the data from each frame of video, digital compression lets one frame of video borrow from the previous frame any information that didn't change. That means that each new frame contains only the data that relates to how the picture is changed from the previous frame. By 1995, the MPEG-2 had become the standard format for video compression. And DVD players came fully equipped with an MPEG-2 decoder. Underneath the DVD, there is a laser. It's reading the data that's on the DVD, pulling it off to this board, which contains the computer technology that's necessary to decompress that MPEG-2 stream of data and make it possible for it to drive a television. DVDs ushered in an era of feature-packed special edition home videos. Could it possibly get any better? How about the ability to pause and rewind live TV? In March 1999, the TiVo Digital Video Recorder, or DVR, did just that. People in the late 90s couldn't imagine having the ability to pause, control live TV, and have all of their favorite shows waiting for them when they got home. By the end of 2000, more than 150,000 TiVos had invaded households nationwide. Today, that number has surpassed one million. So this is Modern Marvels, and it is recording right now. And I can watch it, I can fast forward it. The green bar shows me exactly how much of this show has been saved. And I see a part that interests me, I can stop, I can watch that. At the time, one of the things that enabled TiVo to be the product that it was is that we were able to find a real-time MPEG encoder chip that could take regular analog television and turn it into digital television in real time. So from there, the video is sent through this chip, which is a custom chip that we here at TiVo developed that we called the Media Switch. And the Media Switch writes the video to the disk drive. With a 14 gigabyte capacity, the first TiVo could record one show at a time and store up to 14 hours of programming. Today, TiVos can record two shows at once and store up to 300 hours. You can even transfer recorded programs to your computer, listen to your music library, and create photo slideshows on the device. Of course, digital photo slideshows on TiVo wouldn't be possible without the digital camera. And the very first completely digital consumer camera can be traced back to the DICAM Model 1, made in 1990. Now, this is pathetic by today's standards. That's really the only word possible. For one thing, it's black and white. For another thing, it only has 376 by 240 pixels, or 0 0.09 megapixels of resolution. And it's almost completely tethered to your computer because flash memory hasn't really become possible yet. Smile, Furby. The DICAM could store 32 black and white compressed images. It wasn't until four years later that the Apple Quick Take 100 became the first affordable color camera. Now you can see that people hadn't yet standardized the shape yet, and this looks more like a set of binoculars than it does a digital camera. It's 640 by 480, or 0.3 megapixels, and it has flash memory, but it only has enough memory to store eight full resolution images. Then, just one year later, the Casio QV10 set the standard with its liquid crystal display. By 1995, the digital camera has evolved into the form factor that we're used to today. So it's got a lens, it's got the camera, and it's got an LCD on the back that lets us see the pictures as we're taking them and review the pictures that are in memory. Modern 8 megapixel cameras are a far cry from the original digital cameras of the 90s. Just watch what happens when we compare today's image to the 0 0.09 megapixel limit of 1990. In 1994, satellite TV went digital. DirecTV was at the forefront of Digital Broadcast Satellite Technology, or DBS. 
we have liftoff the direct tv satellite before dbs consumer satellite dishes were large as a hot tub and no programming existed now TV lovers had dishes the size of a pizza and a set package of programming there were a lot of people that didn't believe this was gonna work in fact they thought DBS stood for don't be stupid but the digital part is the key element of it allows us to do the compression which allows us to have many more channels in a transponder we launched with 70 channels and quickly grew to 200 within a few years in addition to digital compression, the advent of higher-powered satellites in the early 90s made the smaller dishes possible. The DirecTV Los Angeles Broadcast Center monitors up to 1,600 channels. We're now in the DirecTV Operations Center at our Los Angeles Broadcast Facility. This is pretty much the way we built it in 1999. The signals that uh, we receive from the outside are brought into this room and displayed on the monitors you see behind me. So this would look like a really cool job, but fundamentally the people aren't really watching television. They're watching for television to make sure that everything is going properly. Once the signals have been compressed and encrypted, the broadcast center beams them to DirecTV satellites 22,300 miles above Earth. The satellites pick up the signal with an onboard dish, amplify it, and use another dish to beam it back to Earth where the viewer satellite dish captures the signal. The dish passes the signal along to the receiver that transmits it onto your TV. When DirecTV launched in 1994, some TV lovers couldn't wait. Within the first year, we had a million subscribers. By the end of the 90s, we had 8 million, and today we're at over 16 million subscribers. From the DVD to the DVR to the dish, our digital devotion holds strong. But another gotta have gizmo from the 90s really took us by storm. Today, we'd be lost without it, literally. Since TiVo is a subscription service, the company is able to anonymously gather its users' viewing habits. The most rewound TiVo moment in history was Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction during the Super Bowl halftime show in 2004. 90s Tech will return on Modern Marvels. January 17, 1991. Operation Desert Storm. Some of our favorite 90s technologies got their start as national defense projects. And during the Gulf War crisis, U.S. troops were fully equipped with one defense tool that allowed them to navigate the vast, seemingly endless desert of Iraq with precision and ease. The 90s technology that made it all possible was the United States government's GPS, or Global Positioning System. The Global Positioning System really proved its operational and military utility during the Desert Storm War and enabled our soldiers to navigate the desert for the first time. The United States Department of Defense began developing GPS in 1972 to track the location of its military units and to provide precision weapon delivery. And a boost in funding was granted to provide the addition of sensors on the satellites that could detect and locate nuclear detonations by foreign governments. On July 17, 1995, the $14 billion global positioning system reached full operational capability. It's the world's largest constellation of military satellites. At any given time, there are at least 24 operational satellites in semi-synchronized orbit, 12,600 miles above the Earth. That means each satellite revolves around the Earth twice a day. They're distributed equally among six orbital planes, so that at least six satellites are within line of sight from almost anywhere on Earth's surface. What can it do for you? This is from the mid-90s. It was 96-ish when this receiver came out, so it knows that we are at a certain location. and It'll actually map it as we walk around. Now I'm standing in a completely new spot. So at this point, I've moved several hundred feet from the starting point 
The receiver receives from the satellites, recalculates my location, but it also did that across the entire path, so it knows the exact steps I took to get here. So how can GPS tell us where we are? By determining the distance to at least three satellites, the GPS receiver can calculate your location. It's called trilateration. Once the GPS receiver calculates how far it is from a satellite, it knows that it must be located somewhere on the surface of a sphere surrounding that satellite. If you draw a sphere around a second satellite, the surfaces of the two spheres intersect at a perfect circle. The surface of a sphere around a third satellite will intersect with the circle at two points. One of those two points is located on the Earth. And voila, you have your location. But during the 1990s, the GPS wasn't always so precise and reliable for civilians. There was a selective availability feature, which is an intentional error so that non-authorized users did not receive as accurate a navigation signal. In fact, throughout the 90s, this slowly changing random error would only place you within 100 meters of your location. President Clinton decided in May of 2000, we are going to turn selective availability off. Suddenly, GPS could identify your position to within 10 feet. At the Schriever Air Force GPS Operations Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado, the Second Space Operations Squadron ensures the satellites are working properly 24-7. We have satellite system operators do a state of health on a satellite. We're going to check the pressures, the temperatures, the roll, the pitch, the yaw of that particular satellite to make sure it's transmitting the best navigation accuracy. Though originally a military project, the market for civilian GPS receivers has become three times bigger than its military counterpart. Just as the GPS found its way out of the desert and into your rental car, Another piece of military equipment used in Operation Desert Storm found its way off the battlefield and into suburbia. Following Desert Storm, the AM General Corporation took the military High Mobility Multipurpose Wheeled Vehicle, or Humvee, and turned it into the Hummer. The original Hummer, or H1, had the same powertrain, chassis, body, and suspension as its military counterpart. In 1992, none other than Arnold Schwarzenegger became the first Hummer owner. But it was in 2003 when a slimmer, less expensive second model Hummer, or H2, hit the market, that this SUV became more commonplace. At the Bergstrom Hummer dealership in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Hummers are ready to fulfill every soccer mom's commando fantasies. To start off with, we're going to be in four high. So 60% of my power is going to be on the rear wheels, 40% is going to be in the front. When I come up to our first obstacle, which is a bunch of rocks, like we're going to go off road, I'm going to go into four high lock. That's going to give me equal traction in both wheels and all four of them. And it's going to be really bumpy, but we can make it real easily. With 365 foot pounds of torque or rotational force, the hefty Hummer can ascend a 60% incline and climb a 13-inch step. The H1 can even ford 30 inches of water because all of the gears are tightly sealed. But the 8,500-pound off-road vehicle averages only about 10 miles per gallon. And the new millennium isn't the guilt-free, gas-guzzling joyride of the 90s. So there's a smaller Hummer the H3. While the H3 maintains the capabilities of the H1 and H2, it weighs 2,000 pounds less and is nearly a foot and a half shorter in length. And it gets 18 miles per gallon, nearly double that of the H1. The Hummer may have brought excitement to some, but another innovation of the 90s started a type of gaming that would morph into one of the most lucrative entertainment products of all time. Geocaching is a worldwide internet-based outdoor treasure hunting game that uses the global positioning system to hide and seek containers called caches. Today, there are more than 400,000 caches hidden worldwide. 
90s Tech will return on Modern Marvels. It's the 26th century. Alien races have invaded the Earth. Led by the barrel of a gun, it's up to you to save humanity. Released on September 25th, 2007, Halo 3 is Microsoft's third of the series for the game system, Xbox. First day sales in the US alone reached $170 million, making it the single day highest grossing entertainment product ever. Halo 3 is a so-called first person shooter game and can trace its roots right back to the 1990s. It was on May 5th, 1992, the computer game developer id Software released Wolfenstein 3D and shocked gamers across the United States. When people first saw Wolfenstein 3D, this world just blew them away. Wolfenstein 3D was a world that you could interact with. You, as the player, take the role of the main character. But the 3D world in Wolfenstein was actually anything but. We call it 2.5D, but all the things that you saw were flat. They were objects drawn. It's what we call sprites. And so it would be just like sort of a, a stand-up cardboard cutout of all the monsters. They were just stretched and scaled in the screen so they could get bigger or smaller depending on how far away you were from them. Wolfenstein 3D may have been one of the original first-person shooters, but it was id Software's release of Doom in 1993 that really established the genre. And fighting the evil demons and zombies took a little bit of the sting out of killing. In every way that Wolfenstein 3D was innovative and irreverent, Doom literally just took that and said, you know, I'll see yours and I'll raise you twice as much. Unlike Wolfenstein, Doom was much more three-dimensional. You had different heights and floors. We even had, you know, this, this, this kind of large outdoor landscapes. One of the things that made Doom so successful was that it was a shareware. You know, everybody could download the first episode. An estimated 10 million people worldwide downloaded Doom within two years. And playing the game wasn't the only thing you could do. Id's John Carmack even designed Doom to allow players to modify and extend the game themselves. Modifying the game can mean anything from replacing one of the enemies with your boss's picture or something, up through creating custom levels. So with Doom, I made the conscious decision that all of the media that we use to create it could be overridden by anything that somebody adds on top of it. Since then, users have created thousands of modifications, or mods, for Doom. Most can be downloaded for free on the internet. Doom really opened up the doors, and it really legitimized PC gaming and our industry, and launched what we see today. Of course, video game players wanted a piece of the PC game pie, but they needed better systems to play them on. So video game consoles underwent a major makeover, replacing cartridges with discs. On December 3rd, 1994, Sony launched the PlayStation, the first video game console that could play disc video games. A game console like the PlayStation is a creative device. You put your CD into the drive, and from there, it goes into an entire computer system that runs code that's on that CD. So the code comes off, loads into memory, there's a powerful computer on here and a powerful graphics processor that's able to invent the scenes that will appear on the television screen based on the input that the user provides to the controller. It was a 90s technology that has given grown men countless thumb blisters. Like many technologies of the 90s, you can add it to the list of electronics that have become a staple in our everyday life. But at the end of the 90s, as the new millennium approached, panic spread about our dependence on computers. <laughs> 